Okay, once again, uh, welcome to sharing uh, lectures. And thanks again for joining us. It's the second uh, time we do this lecture. Last time we were opening with uh, Jan de Wilder. And today we have uh, the big pleasure to have uh, David Kahn from London. And thanks, David, uh, uh, to accept this invitation. Uh, and um, we understand chair as a way of learning, no? Um, and today we would like to learn from you, David. It's quite a personal lecture. Um, and because uh, we understand um, uh, the, the learning uh, by sharing, by discussing, no? debating and argumenting, no? That's what happens in the craftsman ateliers uh, sometimes, no? And craftsmen learn by, by sharing. Students too, no, we too, we like to uh, learn by, by sharing, no? And we asked to our guests to share three of their favorite uh, places, three of their uh, hidden references, then three plants they admire, to share their plans the, they always have in, in mind when uh, doing architecture, working in their studios, no? We ask also three uh, books to open their library and to show three of the secret books, let's say. And finally, we ask them to share uh, three of their uh, recurring ideas, three of their thoughts, so their personal thoughts they have uh, when working. Then uh, three references, three plans, three books, and three thoughts. At the end, 12 images understood as 12 fragments. 12 fragments, fragments of thoughts as pieces of a complex and personal puzzle, let's say. Today we have uh, David, again, thank you, as our second guest. Thank you, David, for joining. Thanks, uh, David, for sharing. And we all look forward to hear from you. Thank you, and thank you all for joining. Thank you, Joao. Um, delighted to be here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm in London um, and yeah, delighted uh, to be invited by uh, Studio Mayol. Um, and I'm a great... Hello, everyone. <laughs> I can see you now. Uh, yeah, I'm a great admirer uh, of Joao ja and Irene's work, uh, so it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, and the format's novel, uh, there are these 12 references and I have 18 minutes to speak. So it's quite quick. I might take a little longer. Um, and I've tried to focus on actually recent thoughts, recent references. So a lot of the content I've is new to share. Um, and in putting together, I came up with the title of SF Architecture, Science Fiction architecture um and hopefully that'll become clear why as we go on so i'll put my timer and see if i can keep the time okay so three references um i'm going to talk a little about the work of the potter lucy Ree, um under the title beginnings uh about the work of herman check under the title pastiche and the work of walter de maria uh, the artist uh, under the title 10 meanings. So this first image is of an exhibition that uh, my studio designed uh, at Kettle's Yard in Cambridge of the work of Lucy Ree. And it was one of the most rewarding exhibition design experiences I've had, and not least because of the quality of the work. Uh, Lucy Ree is kind of fascinating person who was an emigre from Vienna uh, to uh, the UK it was during the war, she was prevented from working when she first arrived because of her status uh, and had to kind of restart a whole career. And she said, um, to make pottery is an adventure to me. Every new work is a new beginning. And she was someone who uh, had a small studio in the same place in London throughout her life. And she made pots every day and they are all incredibly varied. So to some degree, she's a huge influence in a way of working. Well, there's one other thing I should say is that the um, the plinths we made um, were quite inspired by 
uh, the Carlo Scarpa plinths at Palazzo Abitalis in Palermo. Uh, and then what I found out was that um, Scarpa was deeply influenced by Joseph Hoffman, and Joseph Hoffman um, was a great influence on um, the Potter Lucy Rhee. And so there was, through just a kind of associative um, understanding of references, we found roots back to her origins uh, being taught in Vienna. Which brings me on to Hermann Czech. Um, and it turns out that uh, you may know Hermann Czech is an extraordinary architect based in Vienna. And um, his first realized project uh, was the furnishing of a restaurant in which he reused the designs of Josef Hoffmann, various products, armchairs, wallpapers. And I gave a talk with Hermann Czech, uh, which is going to be published uh, next month in Umbau magazine, in which he showed this pavilion, which was unbuilt. Um, and he said in the talk uh, that we gave that um, he was interested in being uh, uh, side put, put together with me because of the fact that we produce follies, pastiche, uh, and uh, he thought this was um, could provide he would provide some enlightening uh, views on postmodernism, and. This pavilion was never built. It's very little published, uh, and it's all of the external surfaces are different materials, different colors, and in the interior is entirely mirrored. So as you would walk around it, you would see um, the park around the uh, pavilion reflected in the interior. And both Hermann Czech and I used the same quote by Josef Frank in the talk, uh, completely un. Um, anticipated, which was anyone today who wants to make something vital must include everything that lives today. The entire spirit of the time, along with all its sentimentality and its excesses, along with all its tastelessness, which at least are alive. Thus, the new architecture will be born of the entire bad taste of our time, its incoherence, its vibrancy, its sentimentality of all that is alive and felt. So, the third um, reference is uh, Walter de Maria's Earth Room. Uh, I visited this for the first time uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, that is despite living in New York um, uh, 15, well, longer, 20 years ago. And this sculpture has been there since the 1970s. So it is a room filled with earth um, and it's extraordinary for all sorts of thing reasons. Um, Partly its physical presence, the fact that it's just, you know, a deep layer of earth, but also that for 20 odd years, the same person has looked after it and is at the entrance to welcome you. Uh, so there's something about the fact that a gallery made the work, that it's still there and it endures. So that when I lived in New York decades ago, it was already there. And um, Walter de Maria uh, said, of this work and generally. I mean, every good work should have at least 10 meanings. I mean, truly, if you have only one meaning, I think you probably, you know, hard edge painting seemed to fail. It only had two or three meanings. You've got to have 10. And I, I really somehow believe a similar attitude within architecture is that uh, there's little point in pursuing one uh, sense of um, the meaning of the work. And I, I really appreciated visiting this for the first time. Uh, which leads me on to three plans. Uh, a plan of the Church of Santa Maria in Cosmedin uh, in Rome, which I've called imperfect. Uh, a plan which is more about, I planned to do a lot of drawings, uh, which is a drawing of a flower from lockdown. And lastly, it's a plan um, of a house that's on the drawing board in the studio uh, on Corsica Street, uh, which is about a garden. So this is actually an old drawing, uh, but it's one that's incredibly meaningful to me. It is a um, survey of a Cosmati floor in the church of Santa Maria in Cosmodin, drawn by my students from 20 years ago at London Metropolitan University. Um, and it's it's a layered drawing. I mean, it's difficult to see because it's quite small on the screen, but you can probably see there's two versions. One, is if you use all the geometrical rules to create this um, floor, you produce one drawing. If you survey it, they don't match. And the 
the geometry was the geometry of theologians in the Middle Ages, which is when this was made. And it is a description of the universe. So there's something extraordinary about the survey drawing, which recognizes the slippage between an idea of perfection, um, the idea of the universe, and the reality of making it. And there's some aspect of architecture that is caught within this um, tension between an idea and the making of something. And in lockdown, probably like many people, you know, our lives changed dramatically. We were at home living with our kids and working with our kids around. And it was liberating in some ways in that I started to draw a lot more, which is something I love doing and then I often don't find the time. And I drew flowers every day um, and filled books. And it's now been very difficult to sustain. But um, there was something about this practice that made me feel closer to this aspect of the work of an architect being not the built, but the environment. And that leads me on to this a particular project, which is a house um, on a plot of land, which so the edge of this drawing represents the edge of the site. And um, we filled the site with rooms, but the rooms are uh, predominantly garden and within them is the house proper. And one of the pleasures of developing the plan has been trying to arrive at a degree of ambiguity between what is garden proper and what is garden uh, within the house. And um, we've had the good fortune to work with um, a, a wonderful garden designer. And um, another aspect of this project, which is unusual, is that the client is able to stage exhibitions. And so he's been creating exhibitions with artworks where the shapes of the rooms he installs within galleries. So there's this sense of it um, being worked on in multiple ways by different people. Um, and well, you'll hopefully see it in a few years when it's completed. Um, so books, uh, I was asked to come up with three books. And so I'm going to read a little bit of Sadie Smith, then Haruki Murakami, and then Ursula Le Guin. Um, so first off, I have to put my glasses on for this. So this this particular essay is what is one of six that Sadie Smith wrote during lockdown, um, and it's a it's a slim book. So I don't know about the rest of you. I don't have a lot of time to read, much as I enjoy it. So slim books help. Um, and the first essay is called Peonies. So the flower, and I'm just going to read a short bit. To plant a bulb, I imagine, I've never done it, is to participate in some small way in the cyclic miracle of creation. Writing is control. The part of the university in which I teach should properly be called the controlling experience department. Experience, mystifying, overwhelming, conscious, subconscious, rolls over everybody. We try to adapt, to learn, to accommodate, sometimes resisting, other times submitting to whatever confronts us. But writers go further. They take this largely shapeless bewilderment and pour it into a mold of their own devising. Writing is all resistance, which can be handsome and sometimes even a, a useful activity on the page. But in my experience, it turns out to be a pretty hopeless practice for real life. In real life, Submission and resistance have no predetermined shape. Even more befuddling to a writer like me is that the values normally associated with those words on a page, submission, negative, resistance, positive, cannot be relied upon out in the field. Sometimes it is right to submit to love and wrong to resist affection. Sometimes it is wrong to resist disease and right to submit to the inevitable and vice versa. There's something about the way Zadie Smith writes that's incredibly immediate. Um, it's it's like she's thinking on the page. It's very discursive. Uh, she's very able to wrestle with her doubts 
but in such a precise way that you feel, you know, allowed into uh, the way that she thinks. And she indirectly, I mean, there was a mention of disease there, uh, talks about what's happening in the world around her. Uh, so it was written during COVID, um, there was Black Lives Matter happening, and it all appears in the in the book, but as a kind of context that's alluded to uh, through her everyday life. So the second uh, book I've picked, so it's a bit wider. So, and this has again, something perhaps to do with lockdown. I've been doing a lot of running um, and uh, I've done more and more to the point that I started doing marathons and I finished the Berlin marathon uh, a few weeks ago, which was absolutely exhausting. Um, and so Haruki Murakami, um, I don't know, one book I first book I read of his, The Wind Up Bird Chronicle, absolutely incredible. So I recommend that. And that's a very thick book. Um, so he is a runner and has run through most of his career. And he writes, in the novelist profession, as far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing as winning or losing. Maybe numbers of copies sold or awards won and critics praise serve as outward standards for accomplishment in literature, but none of them really matter. What's crucial is whether your writing attains the standards you've set for yourself. Failure to reach that bar is not something you can easily explain away. When it comes to other people, you can always come up with a reasonable explanation, but you can't fool yourself. In this sense, writing novels and running full marathons are very much alike. Basically, a writer has a quiet inner motivation and doesn't seek validation in the outwardly visible. For me, running is both exercise and a metaphor. Running day after day, piling up the races bit by bit, I raise the bar and by clearing each level, I elevate myself. At, last, at least that's why I put in the effort day after day to raise my own level. I'm no great runner by any means. I'm a, at an ordinary or perhaps more like mediocre level, but that's not the point. The point is whether or not I improved over yesterday. In, lock, in long distance running, the only opponent you have to beat is yourself, the way you used to be. Um, I mean, I suppose I quite deliberately didn't choose architecture books. Um, they tend to be a bit dry, but obviously it's one could choose writer and replace it with many things, one of which could be an architect. Um, so then the last um, essay, and I've got about three minutes, so I'm going to speed up, um, is uh, The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction, Super Thin, um, by Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, and she wrote lots of uh, science fiction, which I read as a child. And it's absolutely fantastic. She's one of my favorite authors, but you know she also writes um, some very perceptive um, theory uh, adult literature. Anyway, if science fiction is the mythology of modern technology, then it is myth. It, it's, then its myth is tragic. Technology or modern science, using the words as they are not usually used in an unexamined shorthand standing for the hard sciences and high technology founded upon continuous economic growth, is a heroic undertaking. Herculean, Promethean, conceived as triumph, hence ultimately as tragedy. The fiction embodying this myth will be and has been triumphant. Man conquers earth, space, aliens, death, the future, etc., and tragic, apocalypse, holocaust, then or now. If, however, one avoids the linear, progressive, times killing arrow mode of the techno heroic and redefines technology and science as primarily cultural carrier bag rather than weapon of domination, one pleasant side effect is that science fiction can be seen as far less rigid narrow field, not necessarily Promethean or apocalyptic at all, and in fact less a mytho mythological genre than a realistic one. It is a strange realism, but it is a strange 
reality. So I'm going to finish with three thoughts that hopefully tie this all together. Um, the first is, uh, well, I'll tell you what they are. Linger here, the COVID line, and science fiction architecture. So this was last week. Um, we opened a garden associated with an art gallery uh, in a space that was left over at the back of a building in central London. And we worked with uh, an artist, David Shrigley, whose work often involves writing. And we created the pavilion at the back, which says linger here on the roof. And there's a large uh, sculpture in the foreground of a comb and a telephone. And that's by uh, Woody de Othello. Um, and I suppose the, ma the majority of the gallery is white cube spaces for showing artwork. So that was familiar to anyone um, visiting the space. But what was very unusual was that the gallery sought to make a library, a living room, all of the um, office staff have the daylight and the work has artificial light. And they created a garden that's open to the public with a kiosk. And there was something about putting the social life associated with the engagement with art first uh, that um, this project uh, embodied. The second is um, it's a photograph by Max Creasy of uh, a converted cow shed that we finished uh, recently. And you'll see the wall, the walls are all made of block work. And you'll see halfway up the wall, there is a vertical soldier course of block work. And um, that is the COVID line. So the block work built up to that point ran out because the factory that made it locally, this is in Devon, uh, because of COVID, didn't receive any more materials. And so we had to decide with the client what to do. We had to kind of stop building. And we didn't know what blocks we might get, when they might come. So we took all the remaining blocks and made a, a, a vertical course that wraps through the entire building and then waited to see what happened. And someone else later started making blocks. And thankfully they were very similar. And then we finished the job. But um, what's remarkable now is at the time that was just trying to cope with the uncertainty of what would happen and practically deal with the circumstance. But it's now a much more unexpected part of the house that it recalls this moment in the building's history when so much happened. And lastly, um, so this is the science fiction architecture. This is a building that I've been working on for nearly nine years now. So looking forward to it being finished. It's still got scaffolding in the window. It's um, This is a fragment of the tower of a campus for New College, which is part of Oxford University. And um, we were asked by the college to create uh, gargoyles, which are very traditional in Oxford and on all of the historic buildings. And this is a, a pangolin. Um, now you'll probably know um, that pangolins or scaly anteaters were blamed uh, in part for the spread of COVID, um, the SARS virus. And sadly, I think they're, they're very endangered. Um, many were killed subsequent to this theory, which was later debunked. You know, they, they weren't responsible. And sadly, um, it turned out to be other things. But we looked at the history of gargoyles and thought, how can we um, make animal forms on buildings again, but that speak of the present and the world that we live in now, and what message could it um, communicate to the audiences that will pass this in the street and all the students who will live in the buildings. And um, we chose this pangolin um, and hopefully, uh, I mean, this building is built of stone and intended to last 
a long time, as long as we could manage. Um, there will be pangolins around uh, at the end of this building's life. And so I just want to just finish with this uh, science fiction um, writing, or we could say architecture, properly conceived, like all serious fiction, however funny, is a way of trying to describe what is in fact going on, what people actually do and feel, how people relate to everything else in this vast sack, this belly of the universe, this womb of things to be and tomb of things that were, this unending story. And I think that's my 25 minutes. So thank you very much for listening. Um, yeah, pleasure to be here. Well, I sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you again, David. That was insane. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, normally, I don't, I don't do it, but I let, let me wrap it around. I took some yeah, yeah. in my yeah, 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 yeah. piece of paper, you no, know? and I will try also to keep on playing. Um, uh, then I will do not four trios, but for couples of words that came to my to me, and I just took notes while you were talking, no. And first of all, thanks for this uh, cultural background and bringing this culture, meaning that culture it's kind of a recent, um, let's say, not invention, but a, a recent creation culture, but from taken from a really primitive background, no, from primitiveness to culture, then. This could be one, no? Mm -hmm. The second could be complexity. And I hope that it becomes really playful when bringing some contradictions, no? Just blinking the eye to, to, to the Americans, no? Mm -hmm. Again, in between these, I find I found a lot of joy. With this, without this, we cannot do anything, no? But in this joy, a lot of re resilience, no, that we need nine years, no, to end up something, no. And perhaps Saidi Smith will say resistance, but is this kind of really resilience, no? And the last one, it's about building. But I don't know if it's building about building buildings or it's about building stories. Mm -hmm. Stories as the ones you explain us today. This super nice jumping from flowers to gardens, gardens to rooms, rooms to stories no but at the end i think it's about building history i think what you are doing it's in capital letters then i don't know thank you so much again um our students here a few of them uh also thank you and thank you for keeping it short no we're looking thank you so much for the invitation it's a real privilege and uh it's lovely to meet you all um and yeah yeah, oh, good evening. We'll keep, we'll yeah. keep in touch. And yeah. the ones that are online in two weeks, we have an, uh, once again London. Uh, Mary Dugan will join us. Brilliant. Okay. See you soon. Oh, good evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.